the sermon text this morning is from our Old Testament reading, the ears of the deaf unstopped, the tongue of the mute sing for joy. Grace, mercy, and peace be unto you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. So what are we here for, right? What brings us together, what gathers us in this place that we refer to as the house of God? When we listen to, you know, um, so I downloaded onto my phone uh, the Lutheran Hour Ministries Daily Devotional app. And... um, Each morning we try before Olivia and I head off to the high school, uh, before we walk out the door, to listen to that daily devotional. It's coming quite handy. In the beginning of that, it says bringing uh, Christ to the nations and the nations to the church. But to what purpose? Right, right, right. What, what purpose? We have a purpose for sitting here. Uh, we bring the nations, uh, Christ to the nations and the nations to the church for, for a purpose. I know we have an identity, right? We gather together here, uh, refer to ourselves as Lutherans. We have, uh, uh, we have our, a specific hymnal. We have a specific hymnody. We have a specific liturgy. We have an attitude towards that liturgy, uh, mostly that it shouldn't change. We're, we're not into that a whole lot. You know, we've got about two of them. We use them. Let's not mess with them. They've been good for uh, hundreds of years, and, and we want to keep them that way. If for us, uh, our liturgy is as vital to us as the multiplication tables are to a grade school teacher. Okay? Uh, we view them in, in much the same, the same way. Carl Ferdinand Wilhelm Walther, the first president of the Missouri Synod, uh, wrote in his Essays to the Church, the Lutheran liturgy distinguishes Lutheran worship from the worship of other churches to the extent that the houses of worship of other denominations often look like lecture halls, which the hearers are merely addressed or instructed, while our churches are in truth houses of prayer in which Christians serve the great God publicly before the world. Now someone may ask, of what use is uniformity in ceremonies? We would answer, of what use is the flag on the battlefield? Even though a soldier cannot defeat the enemy with the flag, he nevertheless sees by the flag where he belongs. We ought not to refuse to walk in the footsteps of our fathers. And I agree with that, but again, to what end? The liturgy is not an end unto itself. You see, we are here for real, very specific purposes, real and specific emphasis. Even as we come and feel the ebb and the flow of the church year, we feel the rhythm of of the church seasons, the liturgical seasons, What are we here for? We are here for salvation. We are here for salvation. Mr. Barth was talking to the kids about what we hear, and he he let them know what these ears through faith should hear. And we come here, very clearly speaking along with the apostles, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. That is what brings us here, the words of eternal life. That is why we are here, because of eternal life. We are here for confession and absolution. We are here for strengthening of our spiritual lives. We are in a New Testament church. We are here to be assembled to receive the forgiveness, right? For where there is forgiveness, there is life and salvation, where there is the forgiveness of sins, then God remembers those sins no more. If sin is taken away, the only thing left is life and salvation. And this life and salvation comes to us through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, in whose name we distribute the gifts of our God. 
Now the Old Testament reading for this morning and the gospel reading for us this morning both show the gifts of God and both are certainly intertwined together and we are clearly connecting these two readings together this morning, right? Because today we speak of hidden things, things that might be hidden under a cross, things that might be hidden under your own crosses that you bear. Isaiah speaks of a messianic era unto his hearers and those who he was writing. He speaks to those whose physical eyes can only see defeat and the dispersion of their people into foreign lands whose eyes and ears can only hear and see seemingly broken promises, who are tempted to cry out, where is our God? Has he abandoned us? I wonder if we've ever been tempted to cry out like that. Where is God? Where is God? Has he abandoned me? Has he abandoned my family? Isaiah speaks to those who are unsteady, those who are ready to run away, those who are ready to hand the victory to Satan. And what is his word to them? Stand fast. Have you noticed that last theme over the last couple weeks? Stand fast, stand firm. Plant your feet, be ready for battle. Do not run away. Don't run. Isaiah says, behold, your God will come with a vengeance. He will protect. He will pay back the destroyers. Be strong, he says. And even though all the devils of hell be rolled up into one and come at you as one great demonic force, he is saying, our God is still greater than all the forces of the evil one. And when he comes, when he comes, his reign will be ushered in with miracles. The eyes of the blind shall be opened, the ears of the deaf unstopped. The lame shall leap like a deer, the tongue of the mute shall sing for joy. That's Isaiah. We flip over to our gospel reading, and what do we read there in our gospel reading? Can you see why the two of them are linked and hooked together this morning? This is the reason why today we read of the deaf mute man, the man whose ears were opened and whose tongue and vocal cords were made to immediately speak. Jesus is fulfilling the prophecy of Isaiah. There is a reason. And we could have added in today the gospel accounts of Jesus healing the lame. Remember the man on the mat. That's my favorite one, you know that. Take heart, son, your sins are forgiven. Now take up your mat and go home. Right? He did that for a reason. So he wouldn't, the people would know that the Son of Man has the power and the authority to forgive our sins sins. We could read of Jesus making the mud and the dirt and opening the eyes of the man who was blind. There could be added to this Jesus healing the crippled woman in the synagogue. He calls her forth and says to her, woman, you are set free from your infirmity. And he put his hand on her and immediately she straightened up and praised God. That reading there from the gospel certainly sounds like she had what we would call scoliosis, the curvature of the spine, to which Jesus simply touches her and commands her to stand up straight, and she does. Her body obeys the Son of the living God. The man born blind, when Jesus' disciples asked who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind, and Jesus responds to them, neither this man was born blind so that the the might of God, the power of God might be put on display, and Jesus proceeds to give the man his sight back thus showing the power and the authority of God. This is the messianic age, and that messianic age is upon us. Jesus is making that very clear through his miracles, that he is fulfilling what was promised through the prophet Isaiah, what was promised to Adam and Eve from the voice of the living God 
himself. But why these accounts? What about the healings? What is so important about them? Again, to what end? They all prove and give you the evidence that what Jesus says he will do, he will do. What Jesus says he can do, he can do. And what does Jesus say? Jesus says, I give my life as a ransom for many. Proof that Jesus is, as John the Baptist says, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. As Jonah was in the belly of the fish, Jesus says, three days and three nights, so must the Son of Man be in the belly of the earth three days and three nights before he rises from the grave. So that we may believe without doubt when Jesus says, I lay down my life only to take it up again. For that reason, we see Jesus heal. We see Jesus heal so that we might believe the words from the cross, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they are doing. That we might believe the words from the cross when Jesus says, it is finished. The debt of sin is paid for. It is accomplished. We have reconciliation with God the Father. That is the purpose. That is the reason that we might look in the struggles we have against our own personal sins, that we might look at the world in this present darkness, that we might look at the places we have failed our God and believe Jesus when he says, your sins are forgiven you. That is the ultimate end, the purpose. For our sins having been taken away, we have eternal life. It is finished. We must believe these words of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, for often we find that we too are wandering in a desert, that we feel oppressed by our sins and by our weaknesses. There are times that we desire to rise in triumph, and all we can find is that we are pushed down by a cross and feel its splinters in our backs. When we are lame from the world's beatings, deafened by the ravings of a devil who seeks to stop our ears from hearing the gospel, when we are all but blind from staring our own sins in the face, these, my brothers and sisters in Christ, are the reasons why the reasons why we bring Christ to the nations and the nations to the church, the reasons why we have the flag of our liturgy that bring us not the false medicine of things that make us merely feel good for a moment, but rather the liturgy that fulfills the command of Christ, go and baptize. The words of Christ, whoever sins you forgive, they are forgiven. The liturgy that brings the banner of peace proclaiming my body, my blood, for the forgiveness of your sins. That is the why, the great why. That is the water that is in the desert. That is the lame being made whole, given the strength to bear the cross. For the church has been established for the salvation of souls, the proclamation of reconciliation with God, and the coming of eternal life. The eternal life that you and I and all Christians look forward to when we shall rise from our graves, when we shall be made whole again, when that which is invisible in us now will be made visibly manifest and we shall be seen as the heavenly royalty that we were redeemed to be. Then when Jesus returns in glory, his glory will glorify us. 
And no longer shall we battle our sin. No longer shall we fight against Satan. No longer shall we contend against our old Adam. Those battles will be over and the cross of the Christian will be lifted from us and we shall rise in victory to immortality and everlasting life. That is the why. That is the goal. That is the prize. And in that day of glory that we call the parousia, our eyes shall be opened, our ears shall be unstopped. We shall leap and we shall dance, and most certainly we will sing for joy. For we are the redeemed. And as St. Paul says, brothers, we do not yet know what we shall be, but we do know that when he appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And that, my dear brothers and sisters in Christ, is the reason, the end, and the why. In Christ's holy name, amen. And now may that peace which passes all understanding be in your hearts and your minds through the one true faith in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. You have been sharing in the Sunday morning worship service at Zion Lutheran Church, 205 Pulaski Street in Lincoln, Illinois. Zion conducts worship services at 8 and 10.30 a.m. on Sunday mornings. Sunday school for all ages is at 9.20 a.m. in our educational building. And we invite you to join us in person for this worship, fellowship, and Bible study. If you cannot be physically present, join us every Sunday morning at 8 a.m. over WLLM 1370 a.m. or WLLM FM 90.1 or translators at Lincoln and Springfield at 105.3 FM on your radio dial, or on cable channel 5 on Saturday evenings at 5 p.m. and Sunday mornings at 10 a.m. Zion's worship services are also available live via the Internet at www.zlclinc.org. Zion is a member congregation of the Worldwide Fellowship of the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod. If you are without a church home, we invite you to become a part of the Zion family. If we may assist you in any way, please call us at 732-3946 or write to us at Zion Lutheran Church, 205 Pulaski Street, Lincoln, Illinois, 62656. Zion also offers a premier education with a Christian worldview for children from ages 3 through the 8th grade at Zion Lutheran School. If you would like more information concerning our school, please contact the school office at 732-3977. And now we at Zion pray that the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ, the great shepherd of the sheep through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you perfect in every good work to do his will, working in you that which is well-pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen.